so thank you, Brian. Thank you, Claire and the others for setting this up. I'm um, very happy to be here and um, speaking about uh, metallurgy in uh, small, small angle scattering. Because as Brian has mentioned it, it's something that has been um, uh, slowly uh, decreasing in terms of importance in the small angle scattering field, which is a shame because it was at the origin of small angle scattering. So my name is Frédéric de Gezer. Uh, I come from Grenoble. Uh, yep. so, uh, so this is my face here, but of course uh, you should see it already also on the video, hopefully. Uh, if you don't have it, there you go. So I did my PhD uh, in Rouen uh, on atom probe tomography used to study precipitation in aluminum alloys. and um, then I did a, a postdoc at Monash University in Australia uh, to study precipitation, mostly modeling. And then uh, I came to Grenoble as a CNRS research scientist. And uh, here my focus is on precipitation in alloys in general. Um, I do a lot of aluminiums, but also uh, other alloys, and mostly centered around Sachs small angle, small angle X-ray scattering. Uh, as a characterization techniques, uh, although of course I use it with in combination with other techniques, as we will discuss in a minute. Uh, I'm also associated uh, with the with the CRG beamline at ESRF, which is called D2AM on BM2, and uh, a lot of the uh, the experimental work that I'll be showing uh, have been performed has been performed on the, on this beamline. I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, my uh, other contributors for this talk. And um, uh, first, of course, Alexis Deschamps, who has been my uh, closer collaborator these, um, these past 10 years. And we formed sort of uh, precipitation uh, and, well, let's say precipitation in aluminum and Sachs uh, group here in Grenoble. And then the others, uh, some of them are uh, were PhD students uh, with us, and uh, the others are colleagues from other universities and institutes. So, um, what you will usually see in a sort of technique-oriented, uh, or, or say any any topic really oriented talk, is some this kind of uh, this kind of uh, figure where I show the number of scientific articles mentioning small angle scattering as a function of uh, time, and you'll see that it's increasing, and you say, oh yeah, it's great, it's increasing. But of course, we all know this is a bit useless because all the papers in all scientific domains are increasing, this number is increasing. So what's more important really would be a ratio maybe. And this ratio uh, uh, looks like this for small angle scattering. So we see that we've reached some sort of a plateau, which is more or less, uh, which is quite important actually, it's 0.1%, so one out of 1,000 papers, uh, scientific papers, is about small angle scattering, so that's quite a bit. Um, but of course, it's not, uh, uh, you, you, it, it won't, although it, it went to a maximum in the 2000, it's a sort of plateau which is a bit decreasing, so you, you need to, to be careful about that. Uh, an interesting milestone here is this point there, around the 40s, uh, where this image was taken by André Guignet in 1938. And André Guignet, interestingly, uh, discovered um, or co-discovered um, these objects that we coined afterwards Guignet-Preston zones in aluminum-copper alloy. And this, very interestingly, is really at the origin of both small angle scattering and uh, the studies of precipitation in aluminum alloys and actually uh, the, the studies of structural hardening precipitates in most metallic alloys. So it's really a milestone that's very important. And it shows that um, small angle scattering and metallurgy were from the beginning uh, related. And if you look at the proportion of, of um, papers among the small angle scattering papers, uh, the proportion of papers that actually mention uh, alloys, you see that it reached a peak in the 80s and then it's going down and it's been uh, replaced by polymers pretty rapidly, uh, and uh, more uh, recently in the last 20 years by proteins and uh, biological uh, application like this, and then other applications as well, catalysis, et cetera. 
nowadays um, alloys are no more uh, a very important uh, subject for, for smelling and scattering, and it's a shame. You can see this a bit differently on, um, by looking at uh, the keywords of the smelling and scattering papers, and you see that uh, earlier there, were, there was a lot of alloys, aluminium, alloys, aluminium, etc., in the 70s, 80s, and then it turns to materials in general, and then clearly proteins and molecular structure, etc. So there's really a shift in this. Now, I study precipitation in metallic alloys. Why would you do this, really? Why is it useful? Well, the thing is, if you're interested, here I'll focus on mechanical properties, structural properties, let's say, uh, for, for materials that are done for structural uh, applications. And so here I, I, I show a few, say, mechanical properties, or the corrosion is related, but not really only mechanical, of course. Well, these properties, materials, strength, um, how uh, the plasticity of your material, how uh, the rupture properties of your materials, how it breaks, etc., and or how it corrodes. Um, a lot of these properties can be affected by uh, the number of small objects you put into this. And I will focus uh, even more on, on strength, on, on, uh, on what we can do to improve the strengths of our materials. And for and although all these uh, properties are affected by very small objects that you put in your materials, um, uh, the, the objects I'm most interested in would be the one that affects strengths. And these are really in the range of a couple, a few nanometers, like this is an example of a TEM image of an aluminum alloy. So these are really small precipitates. So precipitate strengthening is one of the tools uh, that engineers have to uh, design stronger materials. And this is one of the, uh, the tools I will study. Now, how do you strengthen your materials with uh, small precipitates? Well, the textbook tells us that if you put a dispersion, uh, that, that first, it tells us that if you want to strengthen your materials, you need to hinder the motion of dislocation, of these linear crystalline defects. And with precipitates, the idea would be to disperse a lot of these obstacles to the motion of dislocations. And uh, the dislocation will have to go through this, uh, through this uh, forest of precipitates, of small objects. And you'll all, you've all seen these kind of images where you see that uh, dislocation have to go through a lot of precipitates. And if they're very small, the precipitates are very small, the, the dislocation can actually shear through them. But if they're too big, well, they'll have to loop around them. And these two mechanisms, the transition between these two mechanisms defines some sort of optimal size where the strength is optimal. And interestingly, the size of these optimal precipitates is always uh, around a few one to a few nanometers. Okay, so this is very general in, in a lot of, in all metals I know actually, uh, the, that the nanometric size is very general for, for um, structural hardening. So it means that if you want to observe them, you need a pretty good characterization technique. You can't do it with an optical microscope. Now, how would how do you do this? So again, so sorry, of course, I'll do uh, I'll get back to this, but uh, it's always difficult in this kind of webinar to know what the audience will be. So I don't know if uh, you get, you you people are more specialists of metallurgy, specialists of sax, or of non. So I'll have to introduce a bit uh, of, of everything. So these, these slides are more the textbook um, starting point introduction of um, phase transformation metals. Um, so what we do really is uh, we have an alloy. So an alloy is a mixing, uh, is, is a solution really. And so you put a B into A. So this is the AB phase diagram. And you see that uh, on the top here, it's the liquid, but here we always remain in the solid state, okay? This is a solid state. So if we form an alloy uh, which has this composition, so this amount of B in A, um, the general idea would be to first put it at, uh, at the temperature, which, is, which corresponds to an area where you can put all the B you have in solution. So you have a perfect solid solution. So we call it usually solutionize, solutionizing, solution heat treatment. So you heat it up uh, to a certain temperature where 
all B is in solution, and then you quench it. So you decrease the temperature very rapidly. So the temperature will go down, and, uh, and your materials will be frozen in that super saturated solid solution state. It's super saturated. Why? Because you are now in an area where your materials is normally in a two-state domain, where you want to form both uh, um, B-rich uh, objects and an A-rich matrix, okay? So what it wants to form is this. So B atoms are not happy in solutions. They want to unmix and they want to form B-rich objects. But since you're at room temperature, there's, the mobility is very low and normally it won't happen. Of course, in certain materials, if you leave it uh, for long enough and it happens in aluminum, for instance, at room temperature, it will still start to unmix. Uh, but normally, if you want to make things a bit faster, you will increase the temperature again, put it back in a furnace, but still in the two-phase uh, domain. Uh, and this is where the precipitation will actually happen, and you will form your precipitates. Now, to carry on, and so the, these are heat, uh, classical heat treatments. Of course, you can add, uh, and we usually do, add the formation here, uh, uh, at, at room temperature or uh, during the heating. It depends, there are more complicated heat treatments, but this is really the basics of thermomechanical heat treatment you can do. If we carry on with the, the textbook uh, images, we, we, we need to mention the fact that usually in an alloy system, this is really what you will find in any textbooks. Um, the phase diagram predicts a phase, uh, a stable phase, but in fact, this stable phase is really complicated to nucleate because uh, it's very expensive in terms of interfacial energy. So the nucleation barrier is very high. So what you will find is that mostly the system will actually start nucleating uh, phases which are actually a metastable phase. They are a bit less stable, but their nucleation barrier is lower, so they form much faster. So this is why you will find very often the terms of precipitation sequence, so that the materials will go from, um, from uh, a, a metastable phase, GP zones, theta double prime, theta prime, theta. This is the, the classical uh, aluminum copper alloy that you find in textbooks. Um, so rather than going straight to the theta phase, which is the stable phase, it will first go to GP zones, then theta double prime, theta prime, etc. So this precipitation sequence, this series of metastable um, uh, sequence, is what we're interested in because mostly the most potent strengthening phases are metastable phase. Now, this is a very simple example, but now with a real, real life example, this is a typical modern aerospace uh, aluminum alloys where you see that we have, uh, so those are different aluminum alloys, and this is the one uh, we've been studying and uh, I will be talking to you about. It's a typical so-called aluminum lithium alloys, which has in fact at least uh, six elements and, and sometimes more in them. So there in this system, uh, the number of possible metastable phase that can form and stable phase is actually huge. And what I'm really interested in is uh, here, I, I, I can, think we can drop the, the notion of precipitation sequence and really talk about what I like to uh, talk, and what I like to call precipitation trajectories, that is how the materials goes from the solid solution to the stable phase or the desired phase or whatever, uh, if it goes uh, through other metastable phase or not, etc. So what I'm really interested in is how we can make the system choose the desired precipitation trajectories and how you can identify bifurcation in that uh, in that space. <coughs> so. Okay, so how do you characterize those very small precipitates? Well, because the typical size is one nanometer, the one thing you can do, of course, is uh, indirect techniques. So you'll, you'll measure properties of interest, mechanical properties or whatever, you name it, <coughs> and then you, you deduce information on the, on the particles from this. You can use, and this is about the same, in fact, you can use also calorimetry, resistivity, etc. So this measuring something and deducing indirectly from uh, uh, what, what causes the, the signal you're measuring. <coughs> Direct techniques that actually observe directly these small precipitates are very scarce, of course. Um, firstly, we have 
transmission electron microscopy, TM, and uh, all, all other associated techniques. That's actually uh, a central tool that we need on the on, on physical metallurgy uh, lab, uh, and but it's also uh, not so easy to um, to obtain. It's so very expensive, etc. The same can be said about atom probe tomography, um, and these two techniques. Uh, are essentially very low thro throughput, of course, and they're only ex situ, um, they're very local, etc. So, but of course, they're very important, and we use them all the time because it's, it's uh, very useful and very important. But um, the, the other techniques that can measure directly these precipitates are diffraction based techniques. And among these diffraction based techniques, they're classical Bragg diffraction. Which gives us, gives you the structure, etc. But for these uh, very small precipitates that are very low volume fraction, it's usually uh, not easy to to detect them by diffraction. And the other technique is uh, small angle scattering, which will give you the size and the quantity or the fraction of objects that you're measuring. Okay, so in fact, uh, to measure them directly, we don't have that many techniques. We have TEM, atom probe tomography, and small angle scattering. And of course. Uh, small and scattering is very different from TEM and atom probe tomography in that it allows um, in situ measurement, it's non destructive, etc. But of course, it's also very local and also, uh, and we'll see this in the next slide, it needs an interpretation model. You need to more or less know what you have and what you are actually measuring. So, this is the um, what you see up there is the typical uh, small angle scattering setup. It's in fact a very simple setup, but it's nothing else than a diffraction experiment in transmission uh, geometry. So what you need is a beam of something, uh, x-rays, neutrons, uh, you name it, and you send it on your sample and the sample scatters and you detect the scattering uh, signal on a detector. You have this image, uh, you integrate it or not, and you have a curve and you need to interpret that curve, okay? Uh, so interpretation model will be very important. I'll get back to this. What's very nice on this very simple setup is that you have a lot of room here not, uh, for, for any sample environment you want. And since it's a non-destructive non technique, technique, you can imagine a furnace, a, a tensile rig, uh, whatever the only thing you need is that the beam can go in and then go out okay so you, there's a lot of room for sample environment and in situ experiments it's very nice now i said that you need an interpretation model why that's because okay this is the typical signal you will get for instance and um the the generally your intensity will read something like this uh, it will be separated in three say contribution one which is the intensity, uh, which we call the form factor, which depends really on the shape of your objects. So here, for instance, I've put it uh, for uh, spheres, but if they're not spheres, you'll need another form factor, but you need, to, you need something to input it. Uh, so this is what you find in blue. Of course, the intensity is also proportional to the amount of material you have in your data. So here it's related volume fraction, and also to the scattering contrast. Uh, which is here in red, and the scattering contrast, you can read it here as well, will be related to the concentration, the composition of your, of your uh, objects that you're measuring. And uh, this is very important here because what it means really is that if you want to fully interpret your data, you need to know what's inside because you need to know the shape and the chemistry. If you have this, then you will be able to uh, fit your data and extract size, volume, fraction, etc. So that means you can't use it alone. You need to combine it with other techniques. And this is what we do. So small angle scattering is really a central characterization tool, but it can't be alone, okay? You have to have it with other uh, at the center of other techniques, and this will give you a better, more complete picture, maybe. And the good thing is with this, complete picture in situ, et cetera, you'll be able to confront it with modeling. So it will help you understanding the mechanisms. Now, let's start with a very simple case, uh, spherical precipitates uh, like this one here. So you see it's very nice, very spherical indeed. 
Um, this is in an aluminum alloy, aluminum lithium in this case, uh, but clearly it won't be always that simple and most of the time it's not that simple actually. Uh, now this example is an aluminum, uh, aluminum lithium with a bit of magnesium uh, in it. It's a model alloy and uh, it forms a spherical uh, precipitates that you can see on this TM image. They're all uh, pretty nicely spherical, so I know the shape is spherical. And I looked at them, at them in atom probe tomography and it gives me a composition. So I know the uh, chemistry, I know the shape, so I can now plug my um, my interpretation model into my fitting uh, algorithm and uh, I can do my experiments and these for instance uh, these are in situ experiments we, we did plenty so this slide is a bit uh, busy of course but um, you can see here are isothermal experiments at 150 degrees on the left uh, 120 degrees on the right and this is the side this is the volume fraction size volume fraction and we see that we reproduce size and volume fraction pretty well. We'll discuss uh, why not uh, the beginning later. Uh, and then from this studying uh, microstructure, we can increase the temperature slowly and, and revert, dissolve the precipitates do, uh, during a heating rate. And this is what we've done up there, down there. And again, size and volume fractions are very well reproduced. So it means that um, these kind of in-situ experiments gives us a lot of data uh, that we can confront directly with our modeling uh, of precipitates, uh, which can really well calibrate uh, our precipitation models. And this is super useful to understand here, for instance, we understood the effect of magnesium on the precipitation of the aluminum lithium. The, the, only, uh, the only zone where the fit is not that good is uh, the very early stages of the isothermal uh, processing. And this is very typical. This is because this is when the nucleation is. So it tells us that our models for, uh, for precipitations are not that good because the classical nucleation theory doesn't work so well in this, uh, in this area. And this is actually something we see all the time. Now, small scattering on alloys has a few sp uh, specificities. Uh, first, usually the size dispersion is pretty large, mo uh, larger than on other applications for of small scattering. There are a lot of different uh, more uh, shapes, and these shapes tend to change during the processing. We'll discuss this later. And also, there is both um, the fact that you have many contributions of different phases at the same time, uh, and a contrast that may evolve. So this actually uh, acts on the fact that the the the, cons the composition of your precipitates may actually change or you may have different ones. And also the fact that your matrix, while the precipitates are growing, they're actually eating up some solutes from the matrix, so your matrix get depleted. So the contrast between precipitates and matrix is actually evolving during time. So all these four um, aspects are different challenges of uh, small scattering catching on alloys. And you, there, there are interesting stuff to say on each. I'll, I'll discuss a bit more um, the, the case of non-spherical precipitates here. So again, I'll get back to the, the airspace alloy, aluminum, lithium, copper base alloy, which has been uh, a subject of a lot of interest in our uh, lab these last 10 years. And you, you see that it forms um, two types of precipitates. You don't see it very well necessarily, but there are very thin platelets on this uh, bright fill TM image. Uh, there are T1s on the 111 on the one direction. So you see two variants of them here. And T1s contains aluminum, copper, and lithium. And then there's also theta primes, and they're in the uh, 001 direction. They're also platelets, and they, they don't contain lithium. Okay, so it contains only aluminum and copper. And these platelets are actually very thin. They can grow to hundreds of nanometers in length. So you can imagine it's perpendicular here to the screen. So hundreds of nanometers in length uh, and only one nanometer in thickness. So imagine a plate that is perpendicular to the screen. So if you have this uh, in, a Sachs in a Sachs experiment, so you have make a diffraction image of that, uh, the Fourier transform is something that's flat, it's something that's elongated, so it's a streak. But if you have 
all orientation in your sample. If you have a sample that is a powder and has no texture and, and has very small grains, then your system will be, uh, your image will be isotropic because your, your streak will go all around. If you have a, a strong texture or a single crystal or something uh, similar, then you'll have streaks corresponding to the habit planes of the precipitates and to the Fourier transform of your precipitates. And if you have the intermediate situation, then you have streak all over and you have difficulties interpreting uh, your image. Now, interestingly, if you, have, if you can separate those streaks, then both you can first separate the contribution of the different phases, but you can also uh, uh, measure length and thickness of the precipitates separately. Now, if you have a real life uh, material, then uh, here it's an aluminum sample, it's been rolled, it has a texture, and uh, so you, your sample will be prepared mostly from the sheet, so it will be mostly 110 plane, and then you can analyze in uh, where the 111 directions are, and when they are 90 degrees uh, from the direction of your beam, then it will give rise to a streak, so if you look at the 111 directions and the 002 directions, that is T1 precipitates, theta prime precipitates, and where they are 90 degrees, this is where they are. And you can interpret your images very well. And if you do this correctly, you can model the, uh, the, actual, the quantity of each of the contribution of the precipitates, that is T1 and theta prime. And in this case, you can actually uh, study the competitive uh, precipitation of T1 and theta prime by separating the contribution of uh, theta primes that are on the 100 uh, planes and T1s that are on the 111 planes. And what you see here is, here is the Sachs uh, in situ experiments. It lasted 16 hours where you see T1s uh, getting rid of the theta primes. So, so most of the theta primes has disappeared, but they, uh, they grow bigger. And because they, they uh, come from the same solutes, they compete on the same solutes. Uh, and this is what you see quantitatively here. It's an analysis of the experiments of the last previous slides, where theta prime disappear and T1 appears, and you can follow their lengths. And interestingly, you can also follow their thickness. And what's interesting here is the T1 thickness, which remains exactly uh, the one unit cell, so about one nanometer, one unit cell of the T1 uh, structure. So these uh, objects, they grow in length, but they actually, uh, at this temperature, they actually don't thicken at all. That's very, very interesting. So uh, now we've seen examples of kinetics of precipitation studied by Sachs. Uh, rather than uh, looking at what happens with time, you, you can also put a sample that is actually heterogeneous in space. And this is the example of these, uh, it's the same kind of alloys, aluminum, lithium, copper alloys. Uh, which have been welded. So it's the case when you, you, you do a, a join, they've been friction so welded, uh, welded. so that's a solid state uh, welding technique where you rotate a tool, uh, rotate a tool uh, in between the sheets and it creates a lot of straining and deformation and heating. And this creates a recrystallization that makes the joint. But of course, if this material was um, uh, strengthened by precipitates, T1 precipitates, what happens from these precipitates uh, at the center, we don't really know. What we do know is that the hardness, uh, if you take a slice and you look at the hardness, uh, well, you have a dip at the center here. Well, what we did is we took this slice of our sample and then we scanned the beam and made uh, a Sachs images of, this, the, uh, of the sample at each position uh, on, on the sample. And here I show a fraction of the images. There are actually 4,000 images. There's, there's only one out of nine there. Uh, and you see that far away from the center, uh, we still have these uh, streaks that I've told you about. So here we have the T1s, but at the center is a bit different. Uh, the recrystallized nugget is here, but you see that it, the affected zone is a bit larger and we can interpret this. And so remember, this is 4,000 images that we need to interpret more or less individually. And we see that if you look at size and fraction, the, the T1 precipitates have disappeared from the center. And they've, before disappearing, they've actually thickened quite a bit, actually. And at the center, we are left with uh, very small clusters. OK, so this correlates very well with micro hardness. And uh, so, of course, the welding have 
dissolve the sample, uh, dissolve the precipitates uh, because of the heating. Interestingly, uh, the, the area is actually larger than the recrystallized nugget. So it means that it's essentially a problem of heat and not a problem of deformation. Uh, so you can imagine different strategies where you would actually uh, first weld and then do the heat treatments. But here you find out that you still have a dip at the center, which now has the size, the size of the crystallized nugget, recrystallized nugget, because these T ones nucleates um, on dislocations, and when on the dis in the recrystallized uh, part, there are no more uh, dislocations for this T one to form. So you have actually less, still less precipitates at the center. Okay, so. Now we have uh, this mapping. Um, there's something else I wanted to mention is the fact that I said that Sachs was like, it was really a diffraction experiment. So it's just looking at small angle. So when you look at small angle, you put your detector far away. But if you want to look at diffraction, really, uh, you, you, you need to look at wider angle. So you need to put a detector closer to your sample. So you need a detector here. But if you do this, then you don't have Sachs, except if you have a detector which has a hole in it, and then the, the sacs can um, go through your detector and you'll have simultaneously wide angle, so diffraction peaks, the Bayshera rings, for instance, and uh, the sacs. So you have both the phase and the size and uh, fraction. So this is something we want to do more, unfortunately, for uh, technical issues. We have, we, it's been underexploited in the metallurgy part, but this can be done on uh, the D2AM uh, beam line and uh, we'll, we'll definitely focus a bit more but I'll still it means that rather than having 4,000 sax patterns you have 4,000 sax patterns plus 4,000 diffraction patterns like this one and if you map the intensity for instance of uh, aluminium peaks well you see something that's related to the texture really of your materials that changes at the center of the weld uh, here and here but if you uh, map all intensity of very small peaks, then you'll highlight different zones, the center, the recrystallized nugget, uh, the larger zones, also uh, intermediate uh, zones here as well. So it really tells you about all the different phases that form uh, in that one. Okay, so now with the last part I wanted to tell you, we have seen uh, what happens uh, that we can study kinetics by looking at what happens uh, in Sachs uh, as a function of time. And I've showed you what you can do with heterogeneous samples. So that is space resolved uh, Sachs, so really mapping. But what if we do put everything together and we have a time and space resolved in situ Sachs. So just you take a sample that is heterogeneous, you put it in a furnace and uh, you look at how it evolves. Then you'll have kinetics of your materials as a function of the position, and if this position changes, for instance, in chemistry, uh, then you have, uh, in a single experiment, all the kinetics for all the, the chemistry that you can uh, probe. So that's the sort of uh, directions we, we go more and more, and I wanted to show uh, the proof of concept, concept experiments that we've been doing. So the idea is, as I told you, you have a sample where there is a gradient. So your sample is not um, uh, homogeneous, in composition, for instance, and you'll continuously scan it, but it's in the furnace, and you continuously record a uh, sax pattern. And this really leads to uh, uh, combinatorial metallurgy, because what you can do, for instance, is to join together um, one alloy of one composition, another alloy of another composition, make a diffusion couple, and uh, study how uh, the, the precipitation evolves with time and with composition. So we took a very simple case study, which is a binary copper cobalt system. It's very nice because it gives spherical precipitates, uh, etc. And we bonded, um, we created a diffusion couple where we have one uh, side which is pure copper, pure copper, and the other side which has two percent uh, cobalt. So it's a, a ninety-eight percent copper, two percent cobalt. Okay, and um, we created a concentration gradient that goes from zero to two percent in about two millimeter. So this two millimeter is, uh, was at the time the size of our furnace opening. So we, we couldn't get much wider than this. Now we have other furnaces, but it's, it's okay because we have uh, not too big uh, beam size. So we can actually scan 
the gradients on a large enough uh, area to to resolve this. If you do, if you put this gradient in the furnace and you do uh, experiments at different temperatures, so I'll, I'll skip this, but just to say that one of the very complicated uh, aspects of these experiments is to make sure uh, on where on the concentration gradients your beam is, and we for this we made use of uh, anomalous um, effects in sex. But if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So if you if you very interestingly you you can do only a handful of experiments, and this handful of experiments gives you aspect uh, gives you information on the kinetics of all positions. That is on all composition you've actually scanned. So here uh, there are the results that have been um, that have been confronted to a precipitation model. So of course, um, the agreement uh, is what it is. So it's not bad, it's not perfect. Again, uh, where it's not very good, it's mostly at nucleation stages. Uh, but what's very important to note, to keep in mind is that here we are fitting uh, the, the precipitation uh, model on all temperatures and all concentration at the same time. So this is very, very challenging. This is really um, our, a very complicated um, test for uh, precipitation models. And uh, this is where we want to go more and more. And um, with this, actually, I think I'm done with my, uh, with my presentation. So I'm happy to take your questions.